Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm using uh, a combination of geometrical acoustics and boundary element methods. I'm just going to start off by talking a little bit about the motivation for this work. So algorithms for the simulation of acoustics of spaces are, wi are well established and widely used, as Michael has said. Um, however, oralization, importantly, requires data that covers the entire audible bandwidth. And the algorithms we have, none can accurately and efficiently do that for realistic size scenarios. Why is that? It's because the audible bandwidth covers many octaves, in which case, in, during which wavelength goes from being large, sorry, small with respect to uh, the obstacles, to being quite large with respect to obstacles. I'm just going to illustrate this with a simple scattering problem from Cube. So over here I have a, a low frequency situation where I've got a wave coming in. Uh, there's, there's diffraction, there's interference, they're very, very important. There are reflections, but they're all overlap and you can't distinguish them. Over here in the high frequency regime, uh, it's basically we have very clear reflections, we have very clear shadow zones. Uh, it's easier to represent sound as going in straight lines uh, using rays or beams or something. Probably more efficient to use piecewise polynomials on a mesh like BEM and FEM do. It's important to realize, however, that actually these are all a continuum uh, of some kind of wave dynamics and we have a kind of mid frequency zone where geometric features such as reflections are emerging, shadow zones are emerging, but they're all stitched together with interference and diffraction. Um, so this, this basically, what we really need, in my opinion, is a, is a full bandwidth model, particularly for early reflections, um, but we don't have that at the minute. So um, we've got to see what we can do with what we do have. So these all have limitations, which is why they can't cover the full audible frequency bandwidth. The low frequency methods you see increasing computational costs very rapidly with frequency, and the high frequency methods approximate the wave effects like interference and diffraction, if they even include them at all. So what to do about this? Well, a simple solution that's been done before is to use each in the band the where it works okay and kind of shove them together and let's use a loudspeaker crossover to try, try and get them working. And that's more or less what I'm going to talk about today. So let's just talk about the challenges of, of using two very disparate kind of representations of acoustic propagation next to one another. So one issue is to do with source directivity. Now this is well understood at high frequencies. People have been measuring loudspeakers in the far field for decades and it's quite usual to interpolate these with respect to angle. In wave methods, however, it's uncommon to see anything much more complicated than a monopole or a dipole. Um, and the reason for that is that you're kind of in the near field, you've got to think about distance from the source, you've got to think about the fact that the wave you're radiating is a solution to the Helmholtz equation. Then we have uh, the actual spatial audio rendering. We hear sound coming from different directions and we need to represent that in our oralization. Um, again, for high frequencies, quite easy. We've got a ray coming from a certain direction, so we use the closest HRTF in our data set or we pan it to the nearest loudspeaker in our array. Low frequencies, again, rather more complicated and probably the best we can do is simulate a microphone array with all the limitations that brings. Then we have material models, which Michael said quite a lot on. So at high frequencies, we have absorption coefficient, we have scattering coefficient. These are very kind of blunt instruments. They aggregate a lot of statistical behavior together statistically. They're not very uh, detailed. At low frequencies, we have a locally reacting surface impedance normally. Uh, that's actually really not a lot better. Uh, it's very good for porous absorbers. But if you think of a typical room, a lot of the loss is into uh, membrane modes of lightweight partitions and windows and doors. If someone asks you what is the, that's of course all extended reaction. If someone asks you what's the locally reacting surface impedance of a door, the answer is it's the wrong question. And then we talk about the merging of low frequency and high frequency results. I'm going to say a little bit about this later. Essentially, anything we're going to do here is going to be a bit of a bodge because the algorithms are so different. So we have a situation where the first three are limited by availability of measured data, as, as Michael's pointed out, and all of these are limited by the compatibility of the model's assumptions. So for my low frequency method, I'm going to use boundary element method. Um, this is a wave model based on reflections from surfaces. That means we only need to mesh the surface, which means we have fewer degrees of freedom compared to finite difference time domain or BEM, so F or FEM. Um, it's ideally suited to uh, simulating anechoic scattering, so predicting scattering from diffusers or computing HRTFs. It can also be applied to enclosed problems such as rooms. One feature of the model is that total pressure that we want 
is the sum of an instant pressure, which is effectively what the source delivers anechoically, plus a correction called the scattered pressure. And this is going to be really, really useful when I come to try and look at source directivity, because all I need is an equation for P-Ink that matches the loudspeaker, and I'll just plug it straight in. Much simpler than FEM and FTDD. There's also uh, no numerical dispersion, you get the same wave speed, which in principle is important for this application. We used an open source code called BEM++. Now, this is uh, something that's invoked via a Python API. What that means is uh, the group behind this have done all the hard work. They've, they've compiled all the difficult bits in C++, and you just write scripts that calls them. Really importantly for what I'm doing, they also let you define custom excitation functions. All I have to do is write a Python script that executes the function I want for P-Ink, and BEM++ does the rest. It's an adaptive cross-approximation accelerated. That's an alternative to the fast multipole method, and it gives you much, much faster assembly and solution of the matrix equations. So, finished with the advert for that, which I'm not part of. Um, on to source and receiver models. So we have a, we have a source. Uh, it's radiating a sound wave. Oh, there it is. Um, and my, my mathematical model for source directivity is this, which is quite well established in the spatial audio rendering community. So first of all, I'm only, I'm only representing P-Ink, the, the pressure from the source anechoically, uh, and I'm using some spherical harmonic functions with angle, and my radial term is a spherical Hankel function of the outgoing type. Um, for this actual source, I'm going to need to pick a source order to truncate at this series, and I'm going to pick to have to work out the values of these complex coefficients. Typically, I'd do that by measuring with microphones the source at some, some known radius, and then kind of working backwards and working out what those are. For my listener, it's the opposite um, effect. Sound is, sound is coming in, and I end up with a very similar kind of representation, but now I'm representing P total, because I want the source and the room. Uh, I've got a different set of coefficients, obviously, which we're going to try and find from the model, and my radial functions differ. They're now spherical Bessel functions, which is a wave that comes in, coalesces, and then passes back out again. Um, and that's, that's quite important to realize that I'm actually working out what the sound field is without the receiver present. That makes a lot of sense because HRTFs include the presence of the listener, and if you listen on a spatial audio system, you're stood there, so you are scattering. So it makes sense to work out what the pressure is without the listener present. And again, we, we, can, we, can, work this out. we can work out what ANM is by um, simulating a virtual microphone array. I should point out that another alternative is to actually mesh up the source and receiver but that's quite restrictive because you can only use the ones that you meshed um, and you can't incorporate measured data very easily. What about receivers then? So I'm going to have to work out some receivers to make this array. Um, sorry, integral time. Um, you can't have a BEM talk without integrals. Um, so this is uh, kirchhoff helmholtz boundary integral equation. It's an integral over the surface S. It works out the scattered pressure from the surface and it involves the pressure and the pressure gradient on the surface uh, and this term is called the Green's function, which uh, could, these can basically be understood as a distribution of monopoles and dipoles on the boundary, little sorted. I show this because I want to contrast it against another equation that I derived, which is for spherical harmonic higher order receivers. Uh, and the main point here is that it's quite similar. It's still a, an integral over the surface. It still involves pressure and pressure gradient. But now I compute the coefficients from that receiver statement directly, just for the scattered pressure from the room, of course, um, and I have some different terms instead of the Green's functions, which are converging spherical basis functions centered onto the receiver position of the order that I'm looking for. So they might look something a bit like this. They're, they're converging waves, but they have some angular directivity as well. And then finally, I need to map the source pressure onto the receiver position. I can do that by applying spherical harmonic rotation and translation operations to the source coefficients. So the point here is you don't have to simulate a microphone array. I'm not limited by finer aperture issues or sampling issues. I can get those coefficients directly. So let's demonstrate how well this works. I've got a simple test case. I've got a source and a receiver. They're both order three. Uh, and I've got a panel, a rigid panel just creating a reflection. So first of all, I'll point this source at the receiver, and then to illustrate directivity, I'll swing it around and point it at the center of the panel. 
I actually made up a source directivity for this. The CSN, uh, they've measured a lot of source directivities, but for this demo, I thought it was easier to make one up. Um, so I've made up some far field directivity coefficients. I converted them into near field ones, and then I swung them around to point in the two source directions I was interested in. So first of all, source pointing at the receiver. So here's my source directivity. So these are polar plots. Sorry, the line hasn't come out very well. Um, and here we see the receiver picking up the very strongly a main lobe arriving from the source direction, which is what you'd expect. A weaker reflection off the surface in blue. If I swing the source around to point at the surface, then due to the directivity of the source, the instant sound obviously gets a lot weaker. Uh, and now I pick up a nice strong reflection from the surface. Now this is probably what you expected to see. It's what geometric acoustics has been giving us for decades, but I don't think anyone's done this with boundary element method before. So on to some more practical aspects, uh, encoding source measurements. So in the round robin, they used two sources. One was a little Genelec 8020. The other was the QSE K8, the baby version of this fellow over here. Um, and they were measured at different uh, radii as well. Very, very high resolution uh, data measurements, so much so that we don't run into any matrix inversion issues when trying to calculate the, the BNM coefficients. We can just deploy spherical harmonic orthogonality and get them straight out. We have to choose the source order, and we chose order four for the K8. We chose order three for the NT20. Now, these numbers probably seem pretty low. Um, they're based on achieving 1% reconstruction error up to 1 kilohertz, which is the highest crossover frequency we use between them and geometric acoustics in any of the scenes. Um, and it was a trade-off between achieving acceptable accuracy at the measurement distance and avoiding singular anomalous behavior at small KR. Basically, if you're closer to the source than you measured it, things start to go a bit wayward. There's a similar process for HRTF, but I haven't got time to talk about it. In terms of the merging of low frequency and high frequency results, uh, Mark Harrods and his co-workers in 2009 looked at two methods. The first is the straightforward loudspeaker crossover method with Butterworth filters, which is suitable when uh, your two methods produce incoherent signals. Method two uh, involves a nonlinear correction of phase to, to ensure a flat magnitude response when, when the uh, two models do produce coherent output. Uh, and just as a demonstration of that, this is just the instant pressure from the general air cap two meters as measured. Um, we can see quite different um, uh, results here because the boundary element method, we've worked from the narrow band complex measured data, whereas the geometric acoustics, we've worked from the magnitude in third octave. That's why they're so different. And we can see that because of that, particularly the phase, they're completely out of phase. And we're getting 6 dB cancellation at the crossover frequency, which is clearly no good. We apply Mark's second method, um, and that kind of sorts it out. Um, so that works actually seemingly pretty well, though I, I, I would still emphasize that it's, the whole process is a bit of a bodge. I process too. Um, in terms of material data, I should start off by saying that the round robin has, Lucas and all of his groups, captured some of the best, most detailed absorption of material data I've seen with a fantastic database. Um, scenes 1 to 5 are all anechoic or hemi anechoic. Uh, third octave absorption and scattering coefficients were provided, so we've used those in the geometrical acoustics. Uh, narrow band impedance tube data was also provided for the materials used to construct the samples in these scenes, so we use that directly in BEM. I should, however, point out that this doesn't include any extended reaction behavior, so if any of these panels are moving in sort of flapping modes, which is quite plausible, uh, then that wouldn't be included. However, it's probably pretty insignificant, any absorption due to that compared to the total absorption in the Amico chambers. Scene 9, on the other hand, which, which Michael calls scene 6, so I've obviously put my number in wrong, uh, was a small listening room. Um, and now the absorption is absolutely critical because it's a closed volume. The absorption is the only thing that takes away energy and provides modal and reverberant damping. Um, and in particular, the very, very low frequency absorption is going to be interesting because if we don't have any, the pressure is going to shoot to infinity as frequency goes to zero. And uh, although you say, oh, we'll high pass filter to, to play this back, actually in practice that's quite difficult to do well. Only third octave absorption and scattering coefficients data is available here, so we need to ex interpolate that, and we need to extrapolate into the low frequencies, and we need to make up some phase. Um, it was measured using in situ methods, so she also acknowledged that the low frequency accuracy is limited due to windowing. 
So some materials uh, probably have negligible low frequency absorption, they're pretty rigid. Others clearly support membrane behavior. Uh, we're going to need to make up some low frequency behavior. Uh, just as an example, I'll show you what we did with the glazing at the top of the picture. So these red uh, crosses are the measured third octave absorption provided. The blue line is the absorption calculated from our surface impedance model. And at the top, what we've done is a kind of spline fit with, with purely real uh, impedance, which is quite normal. At the bottom, however, we, 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 we realized that we really did a lot more absorption. So what we've done is we kind of hypothesized the pane size for the glass. We worked out what the panel modes would be for that, uh, worked out the resonant frequencies, and then sort of kind of fudged the damping so it sort of seemed to match in the bottom sort of area here. Clearly fabricated data but required to get anything realistic out. So just to show how that's worked, um, here's, some, here's some initial results. Um, I should point out I haven't seen the actual correct measurements, so I have no idea how accurate these are. Uh, but in terms of plausibility, I would say that these room low cues are a bit on the high side, but they're not, they're not grossly realistic. I've seen things not wholly different to that in measurements. What is unrealistic is that the uh, instant field doesn't go, keep on going to zero at low frequency. It sort of tails off, so something's going wrong there and the pressure goes to infinity towards zero hertz. So to conclude, uh, I've implemented, or we've implemented a framework for full audio bandwidth room acoustic simulation. Uh, we've included source directivity and spatial audio outputs. Limitations. Um, so presently the BEM model has to be recomputed for each frequency, which is very slow. Uh, there are known solutions to that. You can use a multi-frequency BEM or a convolution quadrature BEM, which gives you time domain data directly. Um, the source order should really be frequency dependent. That, that's me being lazy. I need to fix that. Um, the merging techniques can work, but are non-ideal. I would argue that a full bandwidth model for early time is required. And finally, even with this very high quality data, we've got to do loads of extrapolation. So better measurement techniques are urgently needed to work at low frequencies and extended reaction needs to be included somehow. Thank you very much. That's the question which can be asked easily. So, yeah, absolutely. Can you on this, uh, this simple surface. Oh, what, the one that I one for one frequency. Oh, the one that I did as a test case. I, I think it took a couple of minutes. Um, okay. I mean, the, the the code that I've been using, uh, I've been finding that the simulation frequencies, certainly for the kind of lower frequencies, you know, a few a few sort of order of ten seconds is not unusual. It obviously rises quite steeply frequency. It seems to rise at about frequency squared, which is a lot, lot better than the conventional band. Um, however, the thing that's killing us at the minute is that we're doing every single frequency separately, and we have to do them at very, very fine resolution in order so that when we IFFT, we get a sufficiently long impulse response. So that's, that's completely ridiculous. Um, um, and there's, there's no ways of addressing it, but it's just not implemented in the model at the minute. Yeah. Or The geometric acoustics, you said. For both. For both. Um, oh um, I mean, so I, uh, obviously we've uh, refined our mesh with frequency for boundary element method. Um, otherwise, it's just unnecessarily costly at low frequencies. What I have done is I've stopped refining after the crossover frequency because things are getting rolled off and otherwise it would just get take longer and longer and longer. Um, in terms of the, the geometrical acoustics, I suppose you're referring to simplification of, of the meshes. Um, I mean, I think what we're dealing with there is a multi-scale problem. Um, so what we, what we really need is, is local wave solutions of small phenomena that then feed geometric long-term propagation. And that's something I've worked on. I think Dinesh Mancho might have spoken about it on Sunday, but I missed that because I wasn't here. No, did he not? He has published something on that uh, for, gay, for VR. So there are, there are things sort of on, on, on the horizon. Your final comment was that <clears throat> we should e uh, use also measurement methods for, local, uh, for um, extended reaction, for non-local reaction. So how would you implement that in BEM? 
in them, uh, you'd have to couple to some sort of um, membrane model. Okay. So. Again, that's quite well established. Uh, what's the timing, Nina? Yeah. It's, it's okay. Time. So thank you very much, Tom. No worries. Thank you.